Okay, so our lectures today represent a broad spectrum of both teachers and learners. Um, Meg Wolf is the current Medical Education Fellowship Program Director at University of Michigan and provided a lot of guidance and expertise for the development of this talk. Mary Haas is one of our current Medical Education Fellows and a recent graduate um, and current uh, junior faculty at University of Michigan. Um, Dina Kamiz is our, one of our soon-to-be medical education fellows at Michigan and recently completed her emergency medicine training at Baylor. Um, and I'm Haley Ward. I'm one of the third-year residents at Michigan. I'm a rising chief resident, and I will be a critical care fellow at University of Colorado in 2020. Our goals today are to um, talk about innovative bedside teaching techniques that are uniquely suited to the use in the emergency department so that you guys can incorporate them into your uh, educating toolboxes um, and use them to engage and educate learners. Um, some of the things that we're going to be talking about today include post-it pearls. Um, we're also going to be talking about using a live Google Doc as a teaching technique. Um, we're going to be talking about the Socratic method um, using board review on shift and also using a unique staffing model for um, improving education. Thanks, Haley. So to get started, we're going to talk a little bit about the educational pearl. So educational pearls have been around for a really long time, but recently they have undergone a facelift thanks to harnessing the power of technology and social media. In preparing for this talk, I came across a really good article called The Clinical Pearl and What is Its Role in Medical Education. This is from a 2008 issue of Medical Teacher. And in the article, the authors define a clinical pearl as a small bit of freestanding, clinically relevant information that's based on observation or experience. Clinical pearls are derived from patient experiences and should be applicable to other patients. Teachers, who are the givers of clinical pearls, should make sure that the pearls that they're sharing are in line with current practice guidelines and make sense with the existing data that's out there. But clinical pearls can be particularly useful for scenarios where a lot of controlled data simply does not exist. And learners who are the recipients of pearls should take them with an open mind and a grain of salt. They should not be afraid to question them or to ask for references where available, and they should definitely cross-check them with their own knowledge and their own personal experience. All of us in this room probably have our favorite clinical pearls that we like to share, or those that we've stolen from some of our favorite educators. But what are some innovative ways that you guys can share your pearls with your learners? Well, that brings us to whiteboard pearls. Raise your hand if you've heard of whiteboard pearls before. Yeah, so this is actually a pretty well-known innovative te technique that has recently gained steam, probably because it was developed by one of our master educators in emergency medicine, Dr. Amal Matu. And the use of the whiteboard is fairly simple. If you have a whiteboard in your department, every time you staff a patient with your learner, you come up with some clinical pearl that's relevant to the case, and you write it up on the whiteboard. And you can see a couple examples here that Dr. Matu then took a picture of and posted on his Twitter. On the left, he worked a shift with another attending, Dr. Winters. And one of the pearls that you can see under Dr. Winters' section is that a urine drug screen will often miss synthetic drugs such as fentanyl. On the other side of the screen, you can see that he did a themed set of whiteboard pearls because they had a lot of patients on a Christmas Eve shift that showed up with presyncope and syncope. And that prompted him to write out all these helpful pearls related to that particular chief complaint. For instance, patients who present with presyncope and syncope should be considered similar in terms of the differential diagnosis and the workup. But what happens if you don't have a whiteboard in your emergency department? A lot of us don't really have that readily accessible. Enter post-it pearls. And this is another innovative technique that has been championed by other master educators in our field, Dr. Rob Cooney and Dr. Michelle Lin. And post-it pearls are another way to share your pearls with something that's portable and easy to bring on shift. You just bring your packet of post-its, put it in your pocket. When you get to your workstation, every time you staff a patient, pull out a post-it, write a clinical pearl, and put it up on your workspace for all of your learners to see. A disadvantage and advantage to post-it pearls is that there's kind of a small space for you to write in. On one hand, it's good because it forces you to write up pearls that are short, sweet, easy to digest. But on the other hand, you're a little bit limited in the amount of information that you can include. The other thing, post-it pearls are definitely limited by legibility, and many of us know we have terrible handwriting. The great thing about both whiteboard pearls and post-it pearls is you can take a picture on your phone, upload it to a social media platform like Twitter, and this allows you to transcend the limits of space and time with your teaching. 
Learners all over the world can benefit from your pearls, and the learners that you worked with on shift that day can easily reference them long after the shift is over by looking at your Twitter account. This is a, a screenshot from the Academic Life and EM blog uh, talking about how Michelle Lynn is moving her post-it pearls movement from Twitter to Instagram. There's a couple different reasons why she wanted to do this. One is that Instagram tends to be a much more visually appealing medium than Twitter because just by its nature, it's all photo-based. Another is that it tends to target more of the millennial learning generation, which is the target learning population for many of us. You're also not as limited by a strict word count like you are with Twitter, so you can include a lot more information with pictures of your post-its. One of the major downsides, however, is that you cannot easily link back to your reference like you can with a tweet, but a really creative way that Michelle has gone around this is to create a QR code as part of her post-it picture so that you can screenshot it and access the reference via the QR code later. And here's a screenshot of her Instagram account, which in a sense has become a little bit of a teaching portfolio that she can include as evidence of the teaching that she's doing on her shift. And let's say you don't have a whiteboard, you forgot your post-its. You can do what all of us emergency physicians are great at and just MacGyver your own option for sharing your pearls. This is an example done by one of our awesome educators at the University of Michigan, Dr. Sage Whitmore. He used to work a lot in our emergency critical care center and he gets really excited about lung physiology. So he grabbed a random bed sheet from one of the patient's rooms, put it on the wall, and you can see all of his illustrations of lung physiology and teaching pearls related to vent, vent management. Another really creative way that you can harness technology to teach on shift and to share pearls with your learner is to utilize Google Docs. This is a, a screenshot of a series that I have been running on Academic Life and EM's blog called the IDEA Series, which stands for Innovations in Didactics and Educational Activities. In this post, we highlighted a really innovative educator from, the, from Jefferson named uh, Megan Stobart Gallagher, and she's pioneered this really cool method of utilizing Google Docs on shift to teach. The great thing about Google Docs is that you can access them from pretty much any computer that has internet capability. You can edit them in real time. Your learners can collaborate with you and edit them, and you can save them and archive them later. So how does this work? It's really easy. So you get to work, you log into your workstation like you normally do, and you simply pull up your Google account. You open up Google Docs, and you create a Word document that's titled with the date of your shift. You probably want to create a folder where you can archive all of these just so that you can easily reference them later. Once you create the file, you simply open the share settings and you include the email addresses of the learners that you're working with that day. And actually, they do not have to have a Gmail address to be able to access a Google Doc. You can also easily create a shareable link and send it to them to access that way. This is an example of an on-shift Google Doc that was used for teaching, prompted by a patient who presented with atraumatic joint pain. You can see that that patient case prompted a discussion about arthrocentesis, and the teacher in this case was able to pull a really helpful graphic from the internet and just paste it into the Google Doc, showing the relevant anatomy to help in preparation for the arthrocentesis. They also found a helpful graph that details the different characteristics of synovial fluid, depending on the diagnosis. And then they included some other pearls, which you can see at the bottom of the screen, that don't necessarily need pictures. For instance, what alternate uh, causes of pyuria to consider beyond a UTI, and making sure that you consider a ruptured AAA in a patient who's hypertensive and presents with flank pain. Here's another great example of an on-shift Google Doc that you can see the top section is talking about the sensitivity of different radiology modalities for the diagnosis of small bowel obstruction. Not only was the teacher able to put in an image of a small bowel obstruction from ultrasound for the learners, but the teacher was also able to link and reference to helpful foam med resources that the learner can then access later once the shift is over. So there's a couple great advantages to this technique. One is that the learner, not just the one that you're staffing with, can benefit from your teaching for all the different cases that day. And the learner can not only access and read the pearls that you input, but they can edit the document themselves, insert their own pearls, whether it's for their own cases or a senior resident inserting pearls for an intern case that you staff that day. You can also insert graphics and foam med resources like we already talked about. And your learner can access this long after the shift is over once they've had time to reflect and process. They can also input commentary about feedback, which teaching pearls they thought were helpful or not helpful. And it can serve as a memory aid if you've had a really busy shift to insert things that you want to debrief about later to help, help, uh, help you remember. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that your learner buy-in is definitely going to vary by your learner type. We all know those learners that like to just put their nose to the ground and focus on patient care and not necessarily engage in a lot of 
teaching type discussions, they may never open this document. But if you have learners that really like to have good teaching conversations and hear your pearls, they're definitely going to take advantage of this technique a little bit more. Thank you, Mary. Okay, so we talked quite a bit about social media-based solutions, tech things, but sometimes old school becomes new school. You may um, recognize this image of Socrates participating in what is appropriately known as the Socratic method. Socratic method is mistakenly sometimes um, equated with pimping, which has gotten a lot of negative attention. Pimping is widely reviewed as a, as a form of bullying. Um, and its intended purpose is to shame and intimidate your learner into revealing knowledge deficits to motivate them to learn, to, to fix those deficits. We're not here to talk about that. Instead, instead of pimping, you can use the Socratic method as a more constructive way to really engage and motivate your learners. Okay. Um, the difference between the Socratic method and pimping is creating a safe learning environment. Your goal is to get your learner to identify their own knowledge gaps through your cross-examination. Once they identify those gaps, they can work towards uh, um, covering them and moving to the next level. The best way to do this is to use Bloom's taxonomy to really develop questions that aim at specific goals for your learner. So we want to develop a question that takes one of these levels. Okay? And it's going to be the highest one that is appropriate to your learner and their level of training. You want to move through the levels until you get to the highest level on Bloom's Pyramid that the learner is able to answer successfully. Okay? So as an example, we'll start with a patient with chest pain and maybe a fourth year med student. We might start them at understand and ask them to describe um, or, or list off some ACS risk factors for us. If they're successful, then we can move to apply and ask them to interpret an EKG for a patient with chest pain. If you have a senior resident, we might start them at evaluate and ask them to justify the use of systemic lytics in a patient with an MI. If successful, then we move them up and we say we, to create and we can say, how might you develop a research project based on this pathophysiology? Okay. So when done successfully, the Socratic method has many benefits. It engages trainees. It's learner-centered, focusing on what that individual learner needs and where they are in their training. It builds a learning community as multiple learners get together in discussion over your questions. It helps develop critical thinking skills as they move through your questions, and it gives you, the teacher, the opportunity to identify the knowledge base of your learner. So let's talk about some best practices. Create a safe learning environment, because here's how we differentiate ourselves from pimping. When we create a safe learning environment, we first we want to make sure that we know our learner's name, we know their level of training, we know where they are. It helps to understand kind of where they're coming from, if it's a med student, what rotations they've been on, et cetera. Okay? You want to let them know that your goal is to challenge them and to push them a little bit, not to humiliate them, and let them know that it's okay to say, I don't know. Examine the purpose of each question. What are you trying to assess? If you cannot come up with a clear goal for your question, then you really run the risk of being ineffective or making your learner uncomfortable, or both. Ask questions at the highest appropriate Bloom's taxonomy level and move upward. In general, the goal of the educator is to create a query that is just, just pushing or just beyond your learner's ability. Questions that illuminate past experiences or can correct um, false assumptions or misconceptions by the learner can really be transformative. And last, allow for appropriate wait time. Depending on the complexity of your question, this can be less than 20 seconds, this can be one to two minutes. The point is to give your learner time to think and respond to your question appropriately without hanging them out to dry and making them uncomfortable unnecessarily, okay? I always think it's very helpful to say to your learner, I'm giving you time to think about this, so that they're not worried about how long you're waiting for them. Another great way to teach on high yield topics on a busy shift is through board review. This can be done by using visual diagnosis flashcards, reviewing EKGs with pathognomonic findings, or by even having um, your learners answer multiple choice questions before staffing a patient. Um, this is great because the learners know that these topics are high yield and are likely to show up on your board review, or I'm sorry, on your board exams, your in-service in training exams. Um, however, it can be kind of hard for learners to remember them sometimes if the patient that they're staffing has uh, a complaint that is completely unrelated to the question or uh, topic that is being touched on. Um, it, 
one of our attendings, Dr. Will Moyer, does this before every learner staffs a patient. Um, it's quick um, and it also is great because it can be used with any level of learner. We all still have to take those tests um, and know this information. Finally, the flipped encounter is a unique staffing model that can be used uh, to have a different approach to learning in the, uh, when learners are staffing a patient. What we're used to doing is having the resident go see a patient and then the, uh, come up with their differential, their assessment and plan, present to the attending, and then the attending goes to see the patient. Um, this creates a setting where your um, learning opportunities from the patient uh, staffing is kind of framed by the resident's interpretation of the patient's complaint. In the flipped encounter, the patients are seen in parallel with the resident going to see the patient and the attending seeing the patient before the patient is staffed. Um, this way, the attending can focus on the knowledge deficits of the learner and really engage them in the most important part of their presentation, the assessment and the plan. Um, it can be hard to keep up with this on a busy shift, but it is really nice because you can, uh, for more advanced learners, you can focus on the data and the reasons why we come up with our clinical decisions and our dispositions for our patients. So to summarize what we've talked about today, we've talked about uh, post-it pearls, whiteboard pearls, and ways to share them on Instagram or Twitter. We've also talked about live uh, Google Docs um, to be used on shift to teach multiple learners at one time and uh, so the learners can review them at a later time. Um, we talked about the Socratic method and how it can be used to get learners to go up in a level of Bloom's taxonomy. Um, we talked about the incorporation of board review into staffing um, as a way to hit on high yield topics in a short amount of time. And finally, we talked about the flipped encounter, our unique method to engage our higher learners in uh, staffing patients. So thank you for your attention. Thanks, everybody. If anybody has any questions or better yet, innovative techniques not included here that you'd like to share with the group, just raise your hand and we'll bring you the mic. Anybody? Cool. I had a, hello. I had a question about, um, basically, have you guys ever looked into Slack as a form of teaching within a program? Actually, yes. Um, we have a medical education track that our senior residents choose as their professional development track, and we use a Slack group to keep track of all of our resources and teaching points from discussions from our monthly sessions. It's had a variable success. For people who use Slack a lot, I think that they like it, but I've found Slack to be particularly difficult to get buy-in from people who aren't familiar with it. But I think with the right group of people who are into Slack to begin with, it can be really successful. This is a simple follow-up. Can you just explain what Slack is? Yeah, so Slack is, that's, wow, that's a tough, how do I describe Slack? Slack is like an online workspace that you have to log into separately. That's kind of like an online chat room where you can archive different discussion topics. So for our, our Slack is called Medical Education Track. And we have different topics like education theory, upcoming abstracts and meetings for deadlines. And then you can kind of archive things by topic. And unlike email, it's all kind of kept in one running chat room. You can also easily text from your phone. Uh, so it's a little bit more informal and conducive to conversation than traditional like email methods. Yeah. Hi, Kevin Newt from Riverside uh, Regional in Virginia, not California. Um, these are all fantastic uh, methods to make it easier on the teacher to help the learner. I'm wondering if there's been any work in the educational research area to see uh, either by preference or outcome based of, of how effective some of these may be. They sound fantastic and easy, uh, easier maybe in, um, compared to the usual method of either neglect or letting your patients linger. Yeah, That's a great question whether or not any of these have been evaluated from a research standpoint about their effectiveness in terms of learning outcomes. I'm actually not familiar of any data around them. I think this is definitely could prompt some interesting research, actually. Um, Meg or Dina or Haley, can you guys think of any? Anybody else think of any evidence behind this? Yeah. 
definitely ripe for, for research. Any other thoughts, questions, techniques? I'm a little rusty on this, but how about SNAPs? Have you, has anybody used those in your ED? Yes, um, SNAPs is one of the mnemonics that can help guide you when you're staffing learners. Um, this is really bad. I feel like as a med ed fellow, I should remember this. But obviously, this is such a great mnemonic that I can't, <laughs> can't remember it. But just to recap, it's S, summarize, narrow the differential, analyze the differential, compare and contrast, um, probe the preceptor by asking questions about uncertainties or difficulties, and plan management for the patient's medical issues, and then select a, a case-related issue for self-directed learning. Yeah, I think a lot of us are probably doing that structure, maybe not necessarily using that mnemonic, but that is a really helpful approach. Do you find the, the flipped encounter slows down patient flow? Um, do you guys find that the flipped encounter slows patient flow? Um, so sometimes it can because oftentimes you find that you're not at the desk at the same time to actually staff the patients. Um, it depends on the shift, I would say. Um, if you get bolused with a bunch of patients at, at once, it's almost impossible to keep up with. But if you have a steady flow of patients where you're seeing um, people kind of trickle in, it, it can be easier to keep up with. I've found that it doesn't slow things down with your more senior learners. I think it speeds things up because a lot of the history taking and the physical they're quite good at, and there's not as many discrepancies between the attending and the senior resident um, on those portions of the patient encounter, and it's helpful to kind of skip to the, the fun part, if you will, and really hash it out and have time for discussion. Um, I think more junior learners, they're there is a lot to be learned about the history taking and the physical still, and so it's not quite as helpful for them because I feel like I still have to go back and talk about those things with the junior learner. I will say that one nice thing about it is you can, after medical school, there's not a lot of teaching about physical exam techniques, and this is where you can really identify uh, deficits in learners' physical exam techniques. Yeah, I find it's very controversial. Some people really love it because they like that they're having more of a conversation among colleagues rather than presenting a patient. And other people find it takes their autonomy away because it frustrates them that the person they're discussing management with has already kind of made a decision or come to a conclusion about what they want to do. So I think the autonomy piece, like Haley said, is the really critical. You really have to not tell the patient your plan or what you think, um, and you have to really allow the resident to say the plan before you tell them what you want to do. Thank you. Um, Dave Zoda with uh, Hackensack. Um, I feel like probably everybody in this room has already a lot of buy-in to this. It's 4 o'clock, we're in Vegas, and we're hanging out watching this lecture, which was awesome. Um, I'm just curious if you have any suggestions on how to get buy-in from um, faculty that may not feel that way, may, may feel like it's too busy to teach on shift, or I don't have like an, a med ed fellowship training. Like, any suggestions on how to kind of get buy-in from other faculty to, to pull, pull out these pearls? And I wish I had the answer to that question. I feel like that is a question that many academic departments would love to answer. I'm going to field this one to Dr. Wolf. I think uh, that is definitely something we all struggle with. I will say that with many of these techniques, once one person starts doing that, other people feel peer pressure and start doing similar things or start adapting it and realize that it is kind of fun and it just sort of catches on. Anybody else in the room have any other thoughts on? Yep. Get my steps in. Any specific resources that you guys have used um, in our department, one of my thoughts would be if we had like a database to give to our attendings and during checkout, or we had a, kind of a moment of downtime that they could pick a pearl or pick something and prompt them to have that conversation. And that way there is like a rotating kind of basis to make sure that it's not just, oh, well, he talks about PE every single time. Um, Anything that you guys have used that would be easy to access or even like easy to, to start that process? Yeah, that's a great question. That does remind me of some work one of my colleagues, Adam Nicholson, is doing on teaching scripts, where he has developed brief scripts on various clinical topics that come up frequently. 
and his plan is to kind of share them with other teachers and then collect data on how learners respond to it. Um, so that's one thing. And then at our faculty meeting, we present education sound bites, uh, where every, we have this meeting twice a month where one of our educators once monthly will give like a 10, 15 minute presentation. So we actually presented the um, Socratic method thing during faculty meeting. But that's more like teaching techniques rather than a database of pearls. Any thoughts from you guys on that? I think that it is something that if there's interest in starting to use these in your department, um, kind of getting people together and making your own database, I don't know that there's anything out there right now, but it is a, like you could even do a Google Doc um, and just kind of make the, put the pearls in there as people are kind of thinking of them or the ones that they like to use and then share it with all your faculty. I do know that at uh, Texas Children's Hospital where I just trained, they had um, a binder that they would have just literally scripts and everything was ready on multiple topics and they took literally five minutes to get through. At every change of shift, the fellow in the department was responsible for going through them. Um, they were very quick, didn't really stop patient flow because things were already paused for shift change, so that's one thing. Um, going, I know that somebody had the question about motivating other educators to kind of get on board in the department. Um, if it fits at your shop with the culture, I think um, at the place I just came from, there was a pretty strong culture, culture of residents just asking for what they wanted um, and, and saying they would come on shift and say, Dr. So-and-so, what are you teaching today? Can you do it like this? Can you talk about this? Um, and I think a lot of attendings just got kind of used to residents doing that and saying, yeah, sure, I'll talk about it. I'll go to the white bar and we'll talk about that thing you wanted, that PE, whatever you wanted to talk about. Um, that worked for us. So that could be something, you know, if you feel like you're getting difficulty from the educators, empower the residents to just ask for the teaching that they want and see how they respond. That's a great point, Dina. At one of our sites, uh, they incorporate a clinical teaching case each shift. Um, and it's based on a patient that was encountered that day where they then, the oncoming team, the outgoing team will kind of do an oral board style um, uh, prompt to, for the incoming team to answer and then ultimately show them an interesting EKG or tell them the outcome of the case. And that's another good way to incorporate teaching at every shift change. The only other thing I would say is it, it, like um, pearls don't need to be really profound. So they might be as simple as, you know, the differential for a common thing or some, you know, um, diagnostic thing. It doesn't need to be a, 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 big, a big thing. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? Um, my, my name's Dan Mayer. I'm from near Albany, New York. Um, the um, assessment of reasoning tool by the, put out by the um, Disease Error with Society for Improved Diagnosis and Medicine uh, is an excellent tool to use for that kind of a, of a situation where it's just unstructured based on a patient that you see. And it asks the student to define the illness script of the disease that they've diagnosed and then to match up or find the, the things that don't match up with that illness script and then also to go through the differential of those diseases that you can't afford to miss. It's called the Assessment of Reasoning Tool. And it's, it's actually, the way it's, it's presented, it looks like it's a summative kind of a thing, but it could be used formatively also, either way. That's really cool, yeah. I think with any of these, it really requires somebody to champion the cause, and it probably takes it several shifts and a lot of time to really get that buy-in. So I think if you try this technique and experiment with it, don't get discouraged if it doesn't catch on right away people will ultimately start to come to expect it the more you do it. So I think the point is to just care about teaching and to do something that shows you care. I'm just going to restate what I've heard in a different way. This is fertile ground for faculty development. Your, your, uh, your, your faculty have to be taught things just like your residents do. So uh, this could be a regular topic. Resident evaluation is easily a third of what we do as teachers. So this would be really make it user. Friendly. Definitely. Any other thoughts, comments? Can I just put one thing out there? I know that a lot of our, I know that some of the complaints about bedside teaching is that it pauses patient care and it takes time. And a lot of people, until you get into a workflow that allows you to do that and buy in from other people that allow you to do that, it can be difficult. Um, one of the educators at my residency, what he would do is on our whiteboard, he would leave um, like 20 factoids um, with blanks in them or just open-ended questions where you had to list 
you know, bacteria or whatever it was that it was asking for, and people kind of at their own leisure could walk by the board, make note of it, and either jot down an answer or file it away up here, and at the end he would go over all of them. So people could really just take a minute out of their day if they were on their way to the bathroom or on their way to do something else and just stop and look at it themselves and see what they could and could not get. And I think it was really fun for people to be able to assess what their own knowledge, because sometimes that gets difficult when you have a team of learners. Um, so that's another idea. If I could just put in a quick plug for a session that we're doing tomorrow on diagnostic error. It involves using cognitive sciences to reduce diagnostic error and several of your colleagues are going to be helping with that. And uh, the assessment, uh, diag the, the diagnostic assessment tool uh, is one of the things that we'll get to at the end of that. Thank you guys so much for being here at, in the late afternoon in Vegas on a Thursday. We really appreciate it. <laughs>